So uh, thanks for inviting me. Uh, welcome to my, the final talk today. Um, and I'm going to talk today about uh, grammar of coalitional violence. Um, I am an experimental psychologist. I'm really interested in the proximate psychology um, of coalitions and coalitional conflict. Um, and natural selection is designed approximate psychology that allows human beings to navigate coalitional conflicts. And natural selection is dealing with and has dealt with the same problem that we are all dealing with, which is that there's lots of superficial variation among coalitional conflicts. So what natural selection does is it picks out invariances, those dynamics that are recurrent, true for every generation, true for many conflicts, those things that don't vary. And so what I'm going to present today is an attempt, and it's a paper I posted on the group website. It's just a five-minute summary of an attempt to start thinking about mechanistically what may be some of the invariances that the psychology actually uses. And in particular, what I'm going to talk about is uh, a small set of invariant dynamics, actually only four interaction types. And the argument is that all coalitional or in-person conflicts, three or more agents, can be described using a vocabulary of these interaction types. Because that's true, the argument is this is going to be a useful tool for people describing coalitional conflicts, for example, out in the world or out in the field. It's also going to be useful for agent-based modeling if you actually create little agents who are capable of representing just these four interaction types. And finally, and, and closest to home for me, the argument is that because these do such an exhaustive job of describing any coalitional conflict, it may actually be, at least at a, uh, a verbal descriptive level, it may actually be how the proximate psychology uh, of coalitional planning and decision making actually represents the possibility spaces. Okay. So let me be specific. What are the four interactions? So it's alliance, defense, generalization, displacement. Uh, the, these are uh, uh, dynamics uh, actually that uh, people had come up with in the 80s for describing uh, conflicts. Uh, so just really quickly, alliance, uh, first A attacks B. So arrow denotes cost and position uh, or attack. You can use the two interchangeably. Uh, so A attacks B and then uh, C subsequently attacks B. That's an alliance of A and C against B. Uh, defense, again, A attacks B, but now C uh, defends B uh, against A. Generalization, A attacks B, and then A attacks C. And displacement, well, I will use this. Uh, and then displacement, A attacks B, and then uh, B attacks C. So really quickly, the abbreviated claims are that uh, there's actually proximate, th this is the, the framework for how the proximate psychology actually represents uh, coalitional conflicts or decisions about imposing costs. Uh, so there's uh, adaptations for calculating how events are going to unfold using the vocabulary of these interaction types. Um, and what uh, basically happens is there's this long uh, calculation uh, and storage of these concatenated sequences of interaction types. Uh, highest probability, given on the ground cues of likely outcomes, uh, actually is what determines what becomes conscious and what actually gets decided, uh, what people worry about, what they choose to do. Um, and obviously costs and benefits uh, are open parameters in this model, meaning that there's obviously on the ground cues of what counts as a cost, what counts as a benefit. Um, and these are open parameters, meaning they're free to vary. And there's a separate part of the psychology that's translating costs into concrete outcomes, uh, concrete decisions. Right? Um, let me give you a concrete example. Um, so let's say uh, here arrow is uh, denoting cost and position. So agent one is uh, considering uh, imposing a cost on agent two. Now, in the dyadic context, it's just the extended phenotypic interests of agent one, uh, uh, the, the benefits uh, to that agent's extended phenotypic interests, uh, minus the expected costs of, uh, uh, of doing this, right? Or is what going to determine whether or not you uh, uh, impose the cost. Um, if you add uh, a third agent in, uh, then it becomes more interesting. And now this is a representational space of one. So uh, there's two possibilities. One is that if one attacks two, then uh, three will uh, retaliate an attack against one. Uh, that should, if that is calculated as likely, that will reduce the probability and the likelihood that one will attack two. Um, now, if on the other hand, uh, it's likely that three will also attack two, that should actually ratchet up the probability, right? And the claim is this is actually what's going on um, in the head, and this would underlie something like a decision to attack when an ally is present and not when, uh, when 
for one to attack when, when three is an ally, but not when three is two's ally. That would be actually the claim. Um, and then just really quickly, the same calculation can be done from three's perspective. Uh, so uh, um, three can ha have the same possibility space. Um, we can add a fourth agent. And now, in addition to this, uh, it's, it's actually quite simple once you just lay it out. But basically, um, uh, three can decide to uh, attack one. And that will be conditional on whether or not if three attacks one, well, what will four do, right? Will four uh, uh, defend uh, one against three? And if so, then that will make it more le less likely that three will attack one. Um, if, on the other hand, uh, four is going to join uh, and also attack one, that will make it more likely. Um, and then the alternative option, right, is uh, going with, uh, uh, with, uh, with one. Uh, three will join with uh, one against two. Um, and okay, one more minute. Um, and then uh, four will, uh, 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 if four attacks three, four attacking two, that will make it uh, less likely. But if four will join up, that will make it more likely. And so this will be my last slide. But basically, and again, you can read about this in the paper, um, really quickly, if you just start thinking about each agent's perspective, uh, within this framework, things like uh, loyalty, uh, disinterested assessments, uniting around a common enemy, asymmetry between offense and defense, the importance of coalitional narratives and, and coalitional history, uh, attributing why an attack happened, and even things like social identities. Um, and there's even something about scaling up uh, so the question about how you get approximate psychology to scale up to larger sets of social agents, um, these things quickly fall out from doing this analysis. So that's the, the attempt to make this contribution. Uh, please look at the paper, and uh, um, if you have any comments, please let me know. Thanks.